I think the number one quality is leadership and, and, and uh, able to empower players and, and motivate uh, day in and day out. It, this is a tough league and uh, these, get, these, these players work every day and, and just to be able to motivate um, where you break the monotony. Obviously you want a brilliant football mind, but someone that can empower and inspire I think is, is a number one trait we're looking for. You know, I'm excited for the process. Um, it's going to be wide ranging. We're going to interview a lot of different candidates. We think there's a lot of qualified candidates out there. And so we're going to be thorough. We're not going to be rushed. And, and uh, I know for a fact we're going to get the right uh, leader for the Denver Broncos. A wide net has been cast. The first round of interviews are complete. And the search committee has reportedly whittled down the list of 10 head coaching candidates to three finalists. Welcome inside the Pat Bowen Fieldhouse for Broncos Country Connected. I'm Alexis Perry, joined now by Super Bowl 50 champion Ryan Harris. Ryan, you played for five different teams in this league under coaches like Gary Kubiak, Andy Reid, Mike Tomlin. So from the player perspective, what makes a successful, great coach here in the NFL? Well, one, the coach has to be consistent. You know, I can tell you right now what the Pittsburgh Steelers are saying in meetings. First rule in getting better is showing up. Second rule, listening is a skill. It's your job to find out how you listen, and our job as coaches is to give you information in that manner. When you have consistent messaging, that allows players to believe that you're being honest with them. You also need great plays, ingenuity. One of the things I loved about Gary Kubiak is he would listen to players. I mean, there was one game when we won the Super Bowl where I said to him, hey, man, run the ball. We're passing too much. We ran the ball. We won the game. Now, I also said that to him in the Super Bowl. We missed a couple blocks on the run, and he was waiting for me when I was coming off the field. He said, hey, Ryan, if you want us to run the ball, we'll do that. You guys got to be better than that. So you want a coach that's consistent, has creativity in their plays, play, play and play calling, and somebody who really respects the fact that a coach is a part of the team. I mean, Vic Fangio is no longer part of this Broncos team. So a lot of coaches' mistakes, they come in thinking they are the team. Uh-uh, that's a bad coach. Any coach is a part of a team, and you figure that out by the way you interact with your players and also listen to them at key moments. Well, now as we take a look at the 10 candidates here for the Denver Broncos that George Payton and this committee interviewed for nearly four hours each <laughs> over the past week, how do you think George Payton has gone about this hiring process that's maybe different than we've seen in recent years with this organization? Well, I like that George Payton has been thorough. I mean, that yeah. you can see that from the list of candidates you have. But also he's taking people from all over the NFL. He's not focused in on one area. But this also shows the relationships that George Payton has. George Payton has a lot of relationships with these coaches on the screen. But I like that he's taking his time, too, having a second round of interviews. You want to feel like George Payton's questioning even his own process. And that's what I love about why, why we've waited so long to find out who the next head coach for your Broncos are. Well, as of the taping of this show, we do not have a list of official finalists. But Ian Rappaport reported on Monday that it's Dan Quinn, Nathaniel Hackett, and Kevin O'Connell. So as we start with Dan Quinn, he has been a favorite for this position really since the beginning of this process. But in terms of Broncos country, I feel like they're pretty split on Dan Quinn. Why do you think that is? Well, if you look at Dan Quinn as a head coach, his record isn't tremendously impressive. Right. You look at his last time in 2020 he was a head coach. He got Atlanta off to an 0 5 start and got fired. And we all remember the 28 to 3 halftime lead he squandered in the Super Bowl. And then this year he had two candidates for defensive player of the year in Trayvon Diggs and Micah Parsons and was still unable to stop the San Francisco 49ers at home in a playoff game. So I think that's why you get a lot of that. Uh, we don't know about Dan Quinn because his head coaching record is not very flattering when you look at that resume. Well, Packers offensive coordinator Nathaniel Hackett had his second interview with the Denver Broncos on Monday. And I think he's really an appealing candidate for Broncos country, maybe because of his unique personality. And of course, maybe some of the possibilities of what could come with him. We don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, though, of course. <laughs> but why is he such an appealing candidate to you? Well, when you look at the coaching resume of Nathaniel Hackett, the best year that Blake Bortles ever had, Nathaniel Hackett was calling the plays, and they went to the AFC Championship game, and they played that against the Patriots, in which they had like six penalties in the span of three minutes that really changed that game. You could be talking about a Super Bowl champion, Nathaniel Hackett, as a coach. When he was at Syracuse, the quarterback, Nassib, had his best year as a quarterback under Nathaniel Hackett. 
And then all the players that have talked this year from the Packers saying that we love the way he's consistent, he's in, he inspires us, he has good energy, and he listens to us. The number one way that coaches go wrong in the NFL, they do not listen to their players who are on the field. Those are your naive experts. You've got to use the information they're giving you. So for those reasons, I really like Nathaniel Hackett if he becomes the head coach of your Broncos. Well, lastly, Kevin O'Connell, the Rams offensive coordinator who helped the Rams upset the Bucks over the weekend. He's a finalist as well. He's just 36 years old. I think the main knock on him is obviously that he's not the play caller there for the Rams. We all know that's Sean McVay. So do you like the direction that this team would take if they hired a guy who doesn't have head coaching experience and isn't the play caller there for the Rams? Well, what I like about O'Connell is that he understands pressure, right? If you're going to be the head coach here for the Denver Broncos, Broncos country expects a championship. Yeah, you want an AFC West championship title in the division, right? But you also want to go to the big game and win it. So the thing I like about O'Connell, he understands being in L.A., all that talent, all those expectations with the team they have this year, and he's been a key cog in a team that is now in the NFC Championship game. So that's one of the many reasons why I like O'Connell if he becomes a head coach for your Denver Broncos. Okay, now all of these guys have or will interview with other teams. So what do you think it is about this Denver position that is alluring for these guys? Well, talking to multiple agents and multiple different head coaching candidates, the one thing that keeps coming up is that Denver has the best roster that's available oh, in yeah. any of the open coaching positions. I think that's fascinating. I think that's great for Denver that the Broncos fans can be happy that around the NFL head coaching candidates look at this team and say this is the best roster if I want to come in and have success Denver's the best place to do it and so that's a hats off to George Payton and John Elway the job they've done putting this team together to be the best roster in the vacant head coaching spots that's saying something about the work that's been put in in the previous drafts. Well, Ryan, of course, these are reportedly the three finalists for the team. But hypothetically, George Payton calls you this evening and says, hey, I want to add one more guy to the mix. Who would you try to sell to him? That'd be Jonathan Gannon for me. I really like what Jonathan Gannon has done at the Eagles. He started 2-5, and five, that Eagles team, and then he got that defense playing well. They went 7-2, and two, and his defense only allowed 16 points per game at that, in that run that got them to the playoffs. And Jonathan Gannon has some history as a scout in his background, so he understands how to notice and develop talent. I think that's going to be important. So if George Payton's calling me, I'm saying give a second interview to Jonathan Gannon. Let's hear what he has to say. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for the insight. Now coming up on the other side of the break, Ryan will join Lionel Bienvenu and Troy Rank to discuss how the Broncos quarterback plan might play into the coaching search and so much more. Welcome back to Broncos Country Connected. Throughout the 10 interviews held by the Broncos five person search committee, there's no doubt Denver's plan for the quarterback position was a main topic of discussion. For more on how the Broncos could attempt to address the position this offseason and who they might consider with their ninth overall pick in the upcoming draft, here's Lionel Bienvenu, Troy Rank and Ryan Harris. Thanks Alexis and welcome to our Denver 7 segment brought to you by 1-800-GOT-JUNK. All right, Ryan and Troy, we are down to the chosen few. In the search for a head coach, Nathaniel Hackett and Dan Quinn uh, getting second interviews with the Broncos. Uh, Troy, what is George Payton and the search committee looking for in the second interview as opposed to the first one? Well, now you're bringing him to your home turf. You want to show him the facility and also reaffirm what you heard in that first interview. You always have follow-up questions. Remember what George Payton's looking for, Lionel? Leadership, someone who fills the room, someone who can inspire and empower. And sometimes a second interview is just to make sure is this who we thought he was? Now he's on our turf. Now it's a little more uncomfortable. Maybe the questions are a little different. Just make sure you know. And both Dan Quinn and Nathaniel Hackett have those type of personalities. So I don't know that they can distinguish themselves. But we are definitely getting down to crunch time in this coaching search. Well, Ryan, I know you and Alexis talked about the coaching candidates already. But kind of following up on what Troy said, what's the one thing you think could set a candidate apart from the others and be the difference maker in getting the job in that second interview? Well, one of the things that teams look at is who's going to be on your staff. And that's an opportunity for a coaching candidate to say, hey, I'm going to get the best offensive coordinator from here. I'm getting this guy from there. So you can impress them with who your teams of coaches are going to be. But you also get the opportunity to see the city a little bit more, maybe talk to a couple of the players, look at the facilities. Some of these first interviews are done on Zoom, others in person, but they're just here for a little bit. So you really get some time to get to know your coaching candidate if you're the front office on a second interview and find out what they're thinking for their coaching staff. 
Okay, we heard from Aaron Rodgers after the Packers lost to the 49ers on Saturday night. Uh, let's listen to what he said about his future and when he'll make a decision. You know, I'm going to take some time and, and uh, have conversations with the folks around here and then take some time away and make a decision. Um, obviously, before free agency or anything kind of gets going, I don't want to be a part of a rebuild uh, if, you know, if I'm going to keep playing. So, uh, a lot of decisions, you know, in the next couple of months. There you go. Troy, right now, if you look at the betting odds, the Broncos are the favorites to have Aaron Rodgers at quarterback next season if he doesn't stay in Green Bay. So what would it take? How much would it cost the Broncos to trade for Aaron Rodgers? Well, it's a heavy cost, and you're looking at three number ones, a number two, and likely Albert Okuwebunam and or Jerry Judy. I mean, it's going to be five assets. It's going to hurt. But if you're the Broncos and you watch the AFC playoffs with Joe Burrow, with Josh Allen, with Patrick Mahomes, and even in your own division, Justin Herbert, there's nobody that's untouchable, frankly. So when you get to that point, draft picks can't prevent it. They do know after the discussions last spring that it's going to hurt, but they also know that Aaron Rodgers if you acquire him, immediately makes you a contender for both the playoffs and the Super Bowl. Now, Ryan, we said this in jest. Yeah, we get Hackett, <laughs> then we get Getze as the offensive coordinator, and then we get Aaron Rodgers, and they all three come over here. Um, look, first question, would Rodgers solve the problems on offense for the Broncos? And if Hackett gets the job here, does that make a difference? Would Rodgers naturally want to follow? Well, absolutely, Aaron Rodgers solves a lot of problems for you. You're going to score more points, have more first downs. You're going to open up the run game because defenses have to put an extra defender in the secondary or he'll pick you apart. So Aaron Rodgers is the solution to a lot of Broncos country's woes right now. And yes, if you get Nathaniel Hackett, why not hope? That's why we're fans of the Broncos. Hope that Nathaniel Hackett can do something to bring Aaron Rodgers here, but also give Nathaniel Hackett, if he's named the head coach, the opportunity to show who he is and create his own team. But I'm all in on Aaron Rodgers coming to solve the problems of the Broncos. Well, Rodgers had nothing but good things to say about Hack. Uh, of course he did. So we'll see how that works out. But we're also looking forward to the draft here, guys. Mock drafts are already out. Let's say the Broncos are not looking for a quarterback at the ninth overall pick, Troy. Should George Payton just do the best player available, or do we need to have a target in this one? Well, if it's not quarterback and you do have Aaron Rodgers, I think you look at uh, inside linebacker as a chance to get more physical and more speed at that position, and frankly, a three-down linebacker or right tackle. I know that's a favorite of Ryan, <laughs> but you look to address that long-term. They've had more right tackles than Spinal Tap has drummers. All right, thanks, guys. Great stuff. Never a dull moment in Broncos country. And speaking of dull, that does not describe K.J. Hamler and Deontay Spencer. Anything but dull. Denver 7's Nick Rothschild shows us how they're taking their creativity off the field and marching to the beat of their own drum. You know when the, the saying, athletes want to be rappers and rappers want to be athletes, I kind of get that vibe. If this whole football thing doesn't work out, the Broncos could take their show on the road. Specifically, the rapping duo of KJ Hamler and D Nice. It's the boy Spence, aka the babysitter. Going Ooh. crazy. Man, I'm going crazy. Yeah. Might just bag of Skittles and some crazy on some yeah. I say, if the contract not right, I bet you Brett ripped the pin. You don't have to know who Brett Rippin is to get it, yeah. but if you do, then you're going to get it. Deontay Spencer really did start from the bottom. Now he's here. I'm a huge Drake fan. And his flow is designed to work your brain. I feel like I'm a smart guy, so I can have you thinking without actually thinking. Putting words to music is an expression of freedom. I feel like obviously my, my story, my journey, is something definitely I can feel like I can rap about. Sometimes it's also good just to step back and just talk about it and rap about it um, because I'm living, I'm actually living it. On the other hand, Hamler likes to get the family involved. I got the bars. But mama, but mama, when she get a pen and pad, I told her she, I'm, I'm trying to get her signed. Next dollar straight, bust it out like boom. Move out the way, y'all, can't be coming through. Wow, you didn't see him? Sorry, boo. My dad always the backup dancer, or he in the back. He, he one of them, you know what I'm saying? Mama, mama lead in front. Playing that put us on the map, MC Kenny and my hype man in the back. 
she can go old school beats. She can go new school beats. You can put her on a little baby beat. She'll get it. Where, oh, where is my little boy? The one who used to play with Lego toys. So if we've got Mama Hamler versus D Nice, I can't pick just one. Uh, are you the best rapper on the team then? Uh, hands down, yeah. But I 100% want to see this rap battle. I might come out and make a song one day. Well, we can't wait to hear it, Deontay. Still to come here on Broncos Country Connected, a behind the scenes look at what it takes to create the perfect playing surface on game days. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for sticking with us for this final segment of Broncos Country Connected. From technology to security, game presentation and guest services, there's more than meets the eye when it comes to making game days at Empower Field a mile high memorable for the fans. This offseason, we'll be giving you an exclusive look at what it takes to make the stadium experience so special. This week, we're introducing you to the team that's tasked with keeping the playing field in perfect condition, no matter the ever-changing weather conditions here in Colorado. I told Abe that we might want to mow here soon, but it got, it, it got chilly for sure. I don't know what the temp is out there. Uh, my name is Chris Hathaway. I'm a director of Turf and Grounds here at Empower Field at Mile High. Um, I'm in my 13th uh, football season here. Um, I love sports um, as a fan. Um, I was never good enough to be as good as these guys on the field, um, but this is the way I kind of contribute to the game. So I love putting a field out there on Sundays that looks great. Um, if it's September or if it's January, um, that's kind of what I, what, what I get out of it. A lot of people think that this job is just mowing lawns and watching football games on Sunday. We deal with irrigation, we deal with soil heat, um, we're dealing with drainage, we're dealing with weather. We're here every day um, taking care of it, uh, mowing it, prepping it for a game. So I'm a small piece of a bigger puzzle on game day that gets the game going on Sunday and throughout the year. That cart to Matt okay. for those guys real quick. So most game weeks start the week prior. Um, we start looking at weather, start getting um, paint days scheduled. We normally paint on Thursdays of game week with uh, a finish up on Friday. And then on Saturday, I like that day um, for dry down, but I also like in case it's snowing or we need to put the tarp on um, before the game on Sunday. Listen up, so normal bench setup. We'll start on the east side, orange heaters on the side. We'll do goal post check, all that after. Good? We'll start getting our heated benches out. That'll be our kind of our first thing. We'll get benches set. And then as kind of those start wrapping up, we'll start taking pylons, um, goalpost pads, chain sets, um, all that. Um, we'll do goalpost check as well, make sure that's all square, um, ready for the game. Um, I have another two guys taking care of medical cart. Today we'll finish setting up bench tarps. Um, we're gonna probably get out and mow, kind of set the pattern, uh, make it look good for the game. So one of our big things on game day is getting the moisture right. You don't want a field that's too wet and you don't want a field that's too dry. If the field is too wet, then it kind of plays sloppy and really slick. Um, if it's too dry, it's too hard. Um, so they can't necessarily get their, their cleat maybe fully in and or going and get with concussions and stuff like that. So it's just kind of a game we play um, every week. Once the game's over, uh, we go into renovation mode. So we'll bring out a, a vac, sweep up all the divots um, on the field, kind of gets a nice clean surface. A handful of us get out uh, with the seed uh, profile seed mix and we'll walk all the whole field and fill in all the divots. So there's no tripping hazards, no ankle breakers, um, anything like that. And it also has seed in it. So then it's already germinating, hopefully by the next week, depending on the time of the year. Um, but we're we always replenishing that grass we added this year is growth lights. Um, so what we're doing with growth lights is we're supplementing light. So it's getting all the energy it needs to grow during a football season with less light, cooler temps, um, and, and, and snow. It's definitely hard. The importance of having this field maintained at a high level is safety. Uh, you have multi-million dollar players um, on the field um, every week during the football season. Um, so you need a safe, uh, playable field, but also a stable field. I'm passionate about the field because it's a reflection of not only for me and for my guys, but also the organization as a whole. You know, there's people from all over the United States watching us on Sunday um, and possibly the world. Um, so we try to put our best foot forward to put the best product out there um, as we can on Sunday. 
Well, that's all the time we have for Broncos Country Connected, but be sure to follow along for the latest out of the UCL Training Center by subscribing to the Broncos YouTube channel and following us at Broncos TV on Twitter and Instagram. Until next week, from all of us here with the Denver Broncos and Denver 7, thanks for watching.